This podcast is part of the Batman Universe Podcast Network, hosted by the BatmanUniverse.net. Check out everything related to Batman and the entire Bat family at the BatmanUniverse.net, including news and original content related to comics, movies, television, merchandise, video games, and more. Also, check out some of the other unique podcasts that TBU has to offer. Consider supporting this podcast by becoming a patron on Patreon. Even $1 can go a long way in supporting this content that you enjoy. Look for a link over at thebatmanuniverse.net to offer your support now. And now, on with the show. Bat books for beginners. Bat books for beginners. Bat books for beginners. Bat books for beginners. We're a podcast that discusses a man dressed like a bat. Bat books for beginners. Bad books for beginners. Mr. Wayne's family and his lady cat. Bad books for beginners. Bad books for beginners. Chris and Jerry, what's it all about? Let's break the bad books down. When they take a hard pass, then when they lay your money down. Bad books for beginners. Bad books for beginners. Bad books for beginners. Bad books for beginners. Hello, and welcome to this edition of TBU's Bat Books for Beginners, episode 202. My name is Jerry. And I'm Chris. And we are your hosts. On Bat Books for Beginners, we will examine story arcs with Batman and related characters. We'll give you the historical background of the book, break down the plot and the art, and give you our opinions so you can decide for yourself if they're worth a read. Today's Bat Book Chris and I are covering is Batman Long Shadows. So, Chris, tell us about this book. Thank you very much, Jerry. Hey, a little Led Zeppelin there. <laughs> yeah, a li- little uh, Zepp too. Action. Oh, my gosh. That is so good. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you so much. That was outstanding. That was one of your best ones. Oh, I appreciate it. Well, they're it. all best, but Aww. I mean, this, that was a really standout one. That was awesome. I love that song. I used to play it in a band in high school. Really? Wow, yeah. you you went to a great high school then. Well, yeah. yeah. You know, and we I played in a band um with uh if you're if you're uh, a a collector, a toy collector, uh I was in a band with a guy by the name of Gene St. Jean who does um uh toy design, you know, um action figure design. So, wow. that was a lot of fun. Yeah, uh the most uh quote rock our high school band ever got was maybe Time is Tight by Booker T and the MGs. That <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that was about as far as it would go, unfortunately, at the at the school I went to. Uh, uh, so that's really cool. Yeah, well, thanks. Uh-huh. Okay, well, once again, we aren't going to cover Batman number 188 yet. Mm. Today on our menu, we are serving up Batman Long Shadows. Batman Long Shadows is a 128 full-color softcover trade paperback that was published by DC Comics in June 2011 and had a cover price of $14.99. This trade paperback covers the... Issue numbers of Batman 687 through 691, which were cover dated August 2009 through December 2009, and each had a cover price of $2.99, except for Batman 687, which was $3.99, but had a higher page count of 40 pages. Mm -hmm. Now, there also exists a hardcover edition of this story that was originally cover priced $19.99 and was initially released in May 2010. If you want to obtain a hard copy of the story, probably going the digital route would be the way to go. Comixology has this for $9.99 at the time of this recording. Hard copies of the hardcover are very, very exorbitant, going for over $60 mm. from some online vendors, but the paperback can be found for around the $13 range. For our creative team, as per usual, I'm going to go off some online resources and my memory. Now, our writer has been mentioned before, and that's Judd Winnick. Winnick was born in Long Island, New York, and he's 49 years old. Early comic influences were Kyle Baker's Why I Hate Saturn and the comic strip Bloom County. Hey, I remember mm-hmm. that one back in the day. By Burke Breathitt. Winnick graduated from high school in 1988, and he entered the University of Michigan Ann Arbor School of Art, intending to emulate his cartoonist heroes, including Burke Breathitt and Gary Trudeau. He came out with a comic script called Nuts and Bolts, and it began running in the school newspaper, the Michigan Daily, in his freshman year. And he was selected to speak at his graduation. Winnick, though, I think got a lot of notoriety 
Eddie for his appearance on MTV's The Real World San Francisco mm-hmm. back in 1994. <laughs> and Jerry, I got to confess, those 90s were a blur for me. I don't know about you. <laughs> yeah, me too. I, I, yeah, and I, I don't even, I don't think I even got into Real World back then, but I know a lot of people who did. Sure. I first encountered Winnick's work, though, on Green Lantern, his first regular writing assignment for a monthly superhero comic book. Uh, he wrote a storyline in which Terry Berg, an assistant to the character, emerged as a gay character in Green Lantern number 137, cover dated June. 2001. And he also wrote a story in Green Lantern number 154, cover dated November 2002, entitled Hate Crime, which gained media recognition when Terry was brutally beaten in a homophobic attack. Hmm. Uh, Winnick was interviewed on The Phil Donahue Show for MSNBC for that storyline, and he got a couple of GLAAD awards for his work on this title. When it left and he worked on Green Arrow, beginning with issue number 26, cover dated June 2003, he got more media recognition for issue number 43, cover dated 2004, when it was revealed that at Green Arrow's 17-year-old ward, a former runaway turned prostitute named Mia Dearden was HIV positive. When it had Dearden take on the identity of Speedy, the second such Green Arrow sidekick to bear that name, making her the most prominent HIV positive superhero to star in an ongoing comic book. For that decision, Winnick was again interviewed by the media, this time on CNN. In September 2011, Winnick began writing a new Catwoman and Batwing ongoing series that were launched part of the DC's comic reboot in commonly known as the New 52. Mm-hmm. Winnick also wrote uh, The Awesomes, an animated superhero comedy created by Seth Meyers and Mike Shoemaker that aired on Hulu. And more recently, Winnick was writing a series of original graphic novels called High Low, which was aimed at younger readers. Now, for our art, we had Ed Bennis, but he only worked on the first issue of this story. He was previously mentioned on our show. He did the pencils for 687, and I don't want to give him short shrift here, but the majority of the pencils for the latter part of the story were done by Mark Bagley, who I don't think we've ever covered on our podcast before. Mark Bagley was born in Frankfurt, West Germany, to a military family, and he's 61 years old. Way back in 1993, Marvel editor and chief Jim Shooter created the Marvel tryout book to draw a new talent for the comic book industry. And Jerry, I don't know if you ever saw a copy of this thing. It was this sort of like this big uh, oversized book that uh, kind of was limited. Um, I think our local comic shop only had one copy for people to experiment on. Did you mm. ever see this thing before? No, I don't remember it. Yeah, this sort of uh, – it had uh, Spider-Man fighting Dr. Octopus on the cover, and it was not quite complete with the coloring. Well, anyway, the, the contest involved a deconstructed comic book, which contestants could compete, complete, and then submit it to Marvel. And they would declare a winner, and they would be awarded a professional assignment. Hmm. Now, at the time, Bagley was 27 years old, and he was living in Marietta, Georgia. He had almost given up trying to find a job in comics because he was working at Lockheed Martin at the time. Hmm. He really didn't want to enter, but he was convinced by his friend Cliff Biggers, another name in comics, to go ahead and enter the contest. Bagley turned out to win first place for penciling, wow. finishing ahead of thousands of other hopefuls. But after winning the contest, he didn't hear back from Marvel for several <laughs> months. And after approaching Jim Shooter at a Comic-Con, Bagley was assigned to a series of low-profile pro- low penciling comic jobs. Yeah. His comics work during this period included a title called Visionaries, which I vaguely remember. Oh. I think it was based on, on a toy line. And stuff over the Univer- U- new Universe line and backup stories in Captain America. But Back in 1989, a year I remember well, Tom DeFalco and Ron Friends created the team of teenage heroes called the New Warriors. And the following year, they placed a new series on this thing, and Bagley worked on it with Fabian and Cienza. Bagley stayed on this title until issue 25. At this point, though, he was going to move to Amazing Spider-Man. He took over when Eric Larson left the title back in 1991, and he and David Michelini introduced the character Carnage, which first appeared in uh, Amazing Spider-Man number 361, cover dated April 1992. Mm -hmm. But but then in 2000, Marvel publisher Bill Jemis was looking to relaunch Marvel's primarily franchises in a world that would make them accessible to new readers. And to enter the Ultimate Universe line. Mm-hmm. So we had Ultimate Spider-Man, and that would begin a title of Spider-Man mythos from the beginning, but these were sent in more modern contemporary times. Bagley worked on this with writer Brian Michael Bendis. Mm-hmm. And the Bendis-Bagley partnership 
of 111 consecutive issues of Mm. writer and artist made that partnership one of the longest in American comic book history and the longest run by a Marvel creative team, beating out Stan Lee and Jack Kirby on Fantastic Four. And I got to tell you, that was an incredible run. I remember quite a enjoying quite a bit back then uh, some of the issues really didn't have a lot of text pieces but it always left spider-man in a cliffhanger and boy it was love some of those stories were really really a gun punch uh, in 2008 mark bagley signed a three-year deal with dc which i confess i don't recall being quite that long and after that he returned to marvel and you can find him on facebook with regards to his current happenings okay now This title here, Batman Long Shadows, over on Amazon.com, has a rating of four stars out of five based on 17 reviews. And over on Goodreads.com, this has a rating of 3.99 stars. Wow, not quite four. 3.99 stars out of five based on 1,597 ratings and 58 reviews. Ah, but that's not all, (laughs) dear listener. Just what do Jerry and I think of this book? You're going to have to stay tuned. And Jerry, I shall turn it back over to you before you do your recap. Thanks, Chris. So we're going to talk about this story after a few messages from some of our friends. Sawate. My name is Stella, and I am the host of Backroll to Oracle, the Barbara Gordon podcast. Backroll to Oracle is a podcast dedicated to Barbara Gordon, the first woman to hold the mantle of Backroll for an extended period of time, roughly 1967 to 1988. The goal of Backroll to Oracle is to examine the character's history from her first appearance as Backroll and continuing through her tenure as Oracle. Each episode looks at a vintage issue of Detective Comics or Batman, as well as other books like Justice League and Freedom Fighters, and modern issues of Backroll and Birds of Prey. I also keep track of news involving Backroll and other members of the Bat family, and I have a revolving series of segments like Babs in the Tube, which highlights appearances of Babs in TV and film, Shipper Spotlight, which looks at a variety of comic and pop culture couples, gives their history, and determines whether they are hot or not, Reading with Stella, which could be described as an audio drama, or just me reading a book that relates to Babs or doesn't, and of course, the mainstay literature recommendation. I have been blessed to interview writers Scott Beatty and Chuck Dixon on their back row year one work, Brian Q. Miller on his back row run, Dwayne Swarzynski and Christy Marks on their separate Birds of Prey work, and the creators and actors of the back row spoiled the web series. I hope to interview more creators and actors in the future. My goal, most importantly, is to make a fun, entertaining, and thoughtful show that people enjoy and from which they learn. Find the show online at thebatmanuniverse.net and iTunes, and follow the show on Facebook and Twitter at Batgirl to Oracle. Thank you, and fly on, Bats lovers. Welcome back. So here is the story of Batman Long Shadows. With Bruce missing, Dick Grayson has taken over as Batman. He's still getting his footing in the cape and cowl. The mask doesn't give him the peripheral vision he likes, and the cape is too heavy. But that's okay. Alfred can fix it. Alfred misses Bruce, whom he thought of like a son. Dick misses him, too. They remember a time when Superman and Wonder Woman brought Bruce's last cape and cowl to the Batcave for Dick. They had a funeral for the missing Bruce, assuming that he's dead. Dick is Batmanning in his own way, even sometimes in his old Nightwing outfit when he's in the Batmobile and out of sight. This upsets Damien, who insists that only Batman should drive the Batmobile. Dr. Phosphorus is on the loose. Robin tries to take him down on his own. Nightwing shows up and takes care of him. Dick decides that since the Batcave was Bruce's hideout, he should have his own, and they should set up another headquarters. It is the bunker in the penthouse of the Wayne Foundation building. Dick realizes that he has to be extra confident to keep Damien in line. Scarecrow threatens Gotham on a bridge uh, with hostages. He's going to send a cloud of fear gas over the city. Dick Bat shows up and stops him. He also breaks up an arms deal that the Penguin's men set up. Dick is making sure that his work is getting caught on video as opposed to Bruce, who used to try to do things in the shadows, hidden. He wants Gotham to know that Batman is back, and hopefully that knowledge alone will tamp down on some of the rampant crime that's gone on since Bruce's disappearance. Since all this is being caught on video and shown on the news, Two-Face, who is very familiar with Batman, realizes that Batman is having fun, even smiling. This is not the same Batman. He even fights differently. He spends more time off his feet like an acrobat. Hmm... Two-Face is getting intel on Penguin's operation and leaking the info to Batman. 
Dick is pretty smart, though, and realizes he's being set up. Batman shuts down Penguin's gambling den. Penguin's upset and starts getting help from Black Mask. He gets the services of Lyle Blanco, a super soldier. Dick comes to the aid of a burning building, and he's kind of in a flying Batmobile. He puts out the fire with a load of non-toxic foam so people can escape. But meteors come flying out of the sky onto the building. Clayface and Blanco are the cause. They are tough to take down, but with Alfred's help, the Batmobile crashes into and explodes Clayface. (laughs) Batman's able to get a bag over Blanco's head, but Blanco calls to be evacuated and the pair escape. Fires are set all over Gotham, and Black Mask knows that the insurance on the buildings are due to be paid to no one. This will confuse Batman and get the detective off Penguin's trail. Black Mask tells Penguin he can either join his gang or leave Gotham. Penguin opts to leave. Sure he will. Two-Face finds someone called a teleporter that can find uh, the place an object was created. He gives her a batarang, and she's able to find the Batcave. Two-Face enters the Batcave and Batman fights him. Two-Face has surprised Batman in the cave and got some drugs into him via darts. He's dressed in kind of a Batman costume, half blue and half red, though it's possible that might be an hallucination. Either way, it looks pretty cool. The sneak attack allows Two-Face to get the upper hand. He demands to know where the real Batman is. He says that Batman never smiled before, but Dick insists that he is Batman. Alfred's able to hit Dick with some adrenaline darts, which perks him up. Dick goes on a rampage and defeats Two-Face in his own house. Kicks him so hard, even Two-Face's shoe falls off. As the cops take Two-Face to jail, a crowd of crazies attack the police van and free the villain. Looks like Black Mask has another follower now. Dick realizes that Two-Face was allowed to get into the Batcave because it's no longer their headquarters and their guard was down. They decide to turn it back into a cave, like when Bruce first found it. The final thing to remove is Tim Drake's old costume, and the base of the case is hollow, and inside Dick finds a thumb drive with records about Dick's parents' death. What information is contained inside? We will find out another time. (laughs) The (laughs) end. (laughs) So Chris and I are going to talk about our feelings for the story after these words from some of our friends. Greetings, Gothamites. Lane here, asking, does the world really need another Batman podcast? Well, of course it does. He's Batman. However, rather than tackle Batman in comic books, movies, or television, my podcast, Batman Books, The Dark Knight and Prose, will follow the caped crusader via the written word, where the only pictures are those formed in the imagination. Each season, I choose a different book to delve into, and each episode dives deep into a few chapters at a time. So join me as I explore the streets of Gotham between the covers of novels and novelizations in Batman books, The Dark Knight and Prose. Welcome back. Okay, Chris, what'd you think? Jerry, this story initially came out at a time in my life where I was really, really preoccupied with real life events. Mm -hmm. At the time this came out, my father was really, really uh, ill and sick, and he subsequently uh, passed uh, Mm. shortly after. And this was sort of a one and done read for me. Mm -hmm. And I sort of tucked it away. Listening to past podcasts and going over notes, I've sort of sort of merely been dismissive of recent works because not taking account that uh, giving Dick his due as Batman and knowing that this was just only going to be a temporary thing, I more of sell these stories a little short. And Mm -hmm. that was not my intention or, or my meaning. I was really, really digging this story in quite a number of levels. Uh, first off, I want to start with Mark Bagley. Mark Bagley is an artist that I think is extremely talented and one that I just don't think gets enough recognition with my you know, comic buying and perspective, what have you, as, as one of an upper tier artist. You know, I, I got uh, my own class of artists in there and I've always regarded Bagley to be solid, but I just never put him in maybe an elite class like some other card- comics artists. Mm. And I don't know if that's necessarily been fair or if that's just because I'm getting old and I, I've got my own sort of, uh, Mount Rushmore of, uh, the guys like, uh, John Byrne, the sure. Dave Stevens, uh, Neil Adams, what have you. But Bagley is very, very talented, and I know him more primarily as his work on Marvel than I did DC. And I had forgotten his output on 
DC at this time. And my gosh, he is such a fascinating and dynamic artist. If you are the least bit of a Bagley fan, I am sure you're well acquainted with the Ultimate Spider-Man back in the day. But this this was really magnificent stuff, and I was really blown away. It's it's sort of like seeing uh, like a baseball player for you know from from the uh, American League playing on a National League team that you're not familiar with. Oh, it's seeing yeah. somebody. It, in a different uniform and he's he's just knocking it out of the park or, or pitching a no hitter or something and you, you can't believe he's doing it for the other guys you know mm-hmm. that's sort of kind of what i'm trying to equate with seeing mark bagley doing some work here on this i thought we got some great dick stuff and there was a lot of stuff with harvey that mm-hmm. costume was beyond bananas <laughs> yes. just that look of it i i really dug this as a two-faced story so mm-hmm. this worked for me on a lot of levels just the writing some of the stuff with dick going on mm-hmm. And the fantastic artwork. I, I, I really like this a lot. And I, I know that we're going to get into some more deeper thoughts on this, but those were my initial impressions. What were you thinking? Well, I, I liked a lot about this. Um, you know, there's a lot of um, remembering the past. And Dick remembers ambushing Batman in the Batcave as part of his training. And he's also – Dick is also trying to, to train Damien. And I think we really see the, the distinction in how things would be different – with Dick as Batman versus Bruce as Batman, you know, and he's impressing upon Damien. It's like, well, he would say, well, when I was Robin, I did it like this. But being really clear, because he understands that he is going to be a different kind of Batman, that Damien's going to be a different kind of Robin. And he's trying to get Damien to, you know, really embrace his fighting technique um, as, you know, uh, the Robin character. And I think that's really, that really works here for me. And it's, you know, and Damien is beginning, uh, finally to start respecting <laughs> somebody else that, you know, that hasn't terrified him like Bruce originally did, um, so long ago, you know, but, He's really starting to enjoy uh, training with Dick, and I'm really liking that part of it. Um, there is a lot of sadness. You know, they're, they're dwelling a lot on the loss of Bruce. And Dick is going through a little about this poor me, I miss Bruce and don't want to be Batman shtick. You know, that's a, enough is enough with that. You know, I think it's time for him to embrace the cave and cow. Um, but other, otherwise, the way it's being done is really interesting. So, I, you know, it, it gets a pass. I did want to point out one particularly cool um, part of the art. There's a panel, uh, three panels uh, at the bottom of a page where they ask Alfred, um, you know, if he's okay. And so it's three panels of Alfred's face. And I think the panels are identical. I think they're exactly identical. As And in the first one, you know, he's like, am I okay? And then... Nothing. And then the third one is, you know, no, I'm not okay. <laughs> you know? And I just thought it was really, really powerful. I thought it really worked for me as and expressed kind of the depth of Alfred's, you know, loss. And, um, you know, I, I think it's a little heavy handed. Some of the stuff with, um, you know, when when Superman and Wonder Woman bring, you know, um, Bruce's last cape and cowl, I think it was like, all right, this is a lot, <laughs> you know, but I think part other parts of it worked great. How do you feel about that aspect of this story? Jerry, that was a part I only part is it's funny you mentioned that because that was the only part I sort of reread twice. Hmm. And like you, initially I thought it was heavy-handed, and I don't know if I eventually wound up giving it a pass. Hmm. But it did sort of strike me as somewhat being a little bit heavy-handed. And then on my my second pass at it, I I sort of accepted it. Mm -hmm. Uh, I I can't quite put my finger on exactly why it came off as it did. I don't know. It wasn't necessarily with respect to the artwork, the the, the tone of the voice of the character perhaps that did it. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I eventually gave it a pass. Sure. And I think I ultimately did, too. It was just, you know, it's just a couple of panels and it was fine. Um, one thing that I thought was, uh, you know, Dick moving uh, his headquarters out of the back cave into the bunker. Now, this is in the penthouse of the Wayne Foundation building, which is right like in the middle of Gotham. This is probably not the stealthiest place <laughs> to, <laughs> to, you know, have superheroes coming in and out. And, you know, can you imagine the elevator, you know, flashes going up on uh, up the elevator in the Wayne Foundation building, you know, 18th floor, <laughs> the bunker. I, you know, uh, and, and I don't know. They, I don't think they really went into it too, too much other than saying, oh, we're moving. Um, but 
I just thought that was a curious decision. Did you think that's odd? You know, Jerry, I, I think stepping back and looking at it from that perspective, yes, it is. But I, I've been in a lot of RPGs where uh, the penthouse <laughs> was used as a focal point of, 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 of a, quite a number of uh story settings so I, I, I might have to disqualify myself <laughs> with respect to an answer but that said I can definitely see your point uh, 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 as it is but uh, it, it's another thing I guess I has always been in my subconscious as, as of maybe giving a uh, unconscious pass on sure. but boy you make a very very strong and compelling argument yeah now the other thing about here is that this is a really good Alfred story and you know Alfred has you know feels bad for the loss of Bruce, but he also appreciates the differences, uh, in that Dick is. So, you know, he's, he says at one point that, uh, Dick has a different set of luggage, but it's no heavier than the luggage that he had before. <laughs> what a line. What a line. Yes. That's really great. Um, and one thing that was kind of interesting that was kind of didn't go anywhere and I don't think it ever plays out anywhere, but I thought it was a neat little, um, uh, detail is Alfred was talking before Bruce's uh, parents were killed. He said that Bruce was a really good artist as a boy and they showed Bruce kind of, you know, drawing, you know, horses and various, various things. And I thought that was a cool little detail. That was, and I, that would have been the last thing I would have thought of being Bruce with yeah. having him with respect to a talent. I, I certainly would have think he would have been a wise and a stu- student. Mm-hmm. I think he would have had a lot of, uh, questioning skills and a very sharp mind uh, sure. finishing the head of his class being excelling in in math and science but uh, art i would not have thought of yeah so i thought that was that was kind of a cool detail and the last thing about the um the art that i really liked was when they showed black mask's gang uh, it had a real ec comics vibe like the the gang members there was like you know, like, was it the vault keeper was there almost? And, I, you know, I love those comics. So I just thought that was a cool, uh, you know, little reference or something. Jerry, excellent point. Because for me, whenever the black mask has shown up, it, I, it's just like, uh, it's just like, it's like an instant downer for me yeah. for the most part, not mm-hmm. all the time, but for the most part. And because I, I just think he sort of weights down a story mm-hmm. as, as being just, uh, two-dimensional yeah. Uh, character yeah, yeah but when you the way this was rendered really really elevated this in my opinion great great so you know it, it sounds like we both you know we had a lot about this that we liked what if you were going to rate this where would you bring it in at well jerry as i as i was stating before you know i i don't really want to give uh short shrift to these stories here because uh as it goes and if you were just to look at it for for story alone this is a very very capable team we have here with yeah. writing and art and i was really really very very impressed i, I and i didn't even get a chance to mention uh the costume that two-face was wearing and oh, how yeah. awesomely that was rendered really you know was. with with the, with the with the red and the on the one side and the in contrast to the gray on the other and the, the black it was really really sharp yeah. uh I, I liked it a lot. Uh, I'm, I'm going to land with a very, very strong 3.5 mm-hmm. out of 5 on this. I, I was leaning – I was very, very close to a 4, but th- this is a very, very solid story, and I'm going to rate this at a 3.5. Yeah, I, I agree. I would bring it in at a 3.5 myself. I think particularly this is really, really good Alfred stuff in here. I'm a, I would – the only thing really keeping this from going higher is I've – pretty much had enough of, you know, Dick whining about being Batman. And, mm, okay. You know, uh, otherwise, if it wasn't for that, I might very well bring this in at a four. This is a, you know, the, the loss of Bruce, while like we were talking about, maybe heavy handed at times, I, I think it's effective. And I think it, you know, you really feel for the characters. So um, I think that's working here. And, you know, otherwise, even as an action story, it's, you know, it's not one uber action story, right? There's like the little Dr. Phosphorus bit and there's the little um, scarecrow bit and there's the, you know, when they're breaking up the gambling den. I mean, it's little action pieces. 
Um, but you know, the overall story, it's about something, you know, even greater. So I, I would recommend this to somebody, um, as just, even just a, a good bunch of action sequences. Um, you know, it's a decent story. I think, uh, you know, in some ways it's a very kind of average story, but in other ways it's got some really, really cool stuff that I really enjoyed. Jerry, I, I don't want to put you on the spot, but it seems like both of us had a problem with with the particular scene being it heavy handed, mm-hmm. and and I'm wondering why we're in agreement. Mm. Uh, not that we are in agreement, we are in agreement, but I'm just wondering as to why and what what set it off there. If if this scene had played out in maybe the title of the Justice League, would it make any mm. difference? If 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 it was handled in a different way or different voice, do you think it would have mattered? Or we just have to accept that we just thought it was heavy handed and leave it at that maybe it was that there was just too much of it and that you know bringing in superman and wonder woman to kind of like oh here's some more and then we're gonna have the funeral with you know the empty grave and you know it all just seemed like it was a little too heart stringy like that just that step too far um, and maybe if it was the only thing they did in the story, maybe it wouldn't have been so bad, but it was just kind of this ever present, um, mood. And that was just kind of a little bit too much. Jerry, I think you nailed it when you said step too far. Mm, I, I okay. think that, that summed it up for me right there. I, I don't think necessarily the scene itself was out of place, mm-hmm. even in this title versus a title say is justice league, but just how it was handed. And like you said, maybe step too far, I think, really, really encapsulates uh, my feelings. So I, I appreciate you saying that. No, not at all. Yeah, th- but it's a great question. It's a great question. I think people would enjoy this this book. I really do. Oh, absolutely. All right, fantastic. So I think that's all we have for this story. Um, now, you know, Chris and I, we do a bunch of other things out, out there in the great wide podcasting and um, comic book and other things world. Um, you can find Chris out on, um, on Twitter at BTO and Bat Books. And uh, he reviews uh, Batman Adventures on Batgirl to Oracle, which is always fantastic. Thank you so much, Jerry. Yeah, uh, current issue, uh, current issue, <laughs> the current episode we looked at, we, I looked at a great story from Batman Adventures with mm-hmm. a classic Batman and Joker matchup that I just really loved. It was one of my favorite issues of that particular story. I also look at Nightwing, mm-hmm. and I look at it from the shipper lens, and this is the so current cool. Nightwing title. So it's a segment within a segment that I call Nightwatch that I have a lot of fun with, and I've really, really been uh, fortunate to have uh, had a little have a little piece of uh, Stella show. And I, I, I'm very, very grateful, That's right. but I am also grateful that I have an awesome partner who is a talented <laughs> writer. Oh, well, thank you. And he also writes great reviews on two of my favorite yeah, mine too. characters in the Batman universe. And that would be Batgirl and Catwoman. Jerry, how fun is it that you're getting to write these reviews of two titles? I really like, yeah. uh, and I, for listeners, do yourself a favor. Go to thebatmanuniverse.net. Look for uh, Jerry Green and Batgirl and Catwoman. Are you digging these still titles still, Jerry? Are I you sure loving am. it? I really yes. am. Um, Batgirl just uh, kind of finished up an arc, uh, but I think that there's more to come there. And Catwoman is, I mean, it's just a terrific title, um, the, you know, these days. And, you know, it's so nice to see both of these books you know, with these two characters that I think you and I both love that, um, you know, doing so well, both of them at the same time out there. And, you know, there's a ton of other things. If these aren't your favorite characters, if you like Bat Family characters, definitely go out and check out the BatmanUniverse.net because there is just everything that you could imagine uh, Batman wise out there. So um, you will not be disappointed. Jerry, can the listeners also find you on Twitter as well, my friend? Absolutely. You can find me on Twitter at Professor Frenzy. And if you go out there and uh, uh, check me out on Twitter, I uh, tweet my weekly comics. I talk about indie comics a lot. Uh, tweet, tweet about, you know, horror movies, not slasher movies, but, you know, spooky horror movies, old stuff, um, dark shadows. And on Saturday nights, uh, we live tweet horror movies at the hashtag Svengooly, where we watch, uh, whatever Svengooly's showing on, uh, Saturday nights, which is always a lot of fun. 
Absolutely. Yeah. Jerry, you know, I think I, I think I even got to see you on that Twitter feed before we even met. So, I, I mean, it's so. it's a, it's a great place to meet people. It sure well. is. And, and, and crack wise. Absolutely. You know, those kind of old timey horror movie fans are, um, you know, it's a special bunch. <laughs> so yes, we absolutely. So now also don't forget to check Chris and I out on the Professor Frenzy show. Uh, By the time this episode is aired, we will have released 45 episodes of the Professor Frenzy Show, uh, the podcast Chris and I have on indie comics and other pop culture topics. And we've been having just a great time. The indie comics world is booming right now. And so check the show out. uh, Search on iTunes for the Professor Frenzy Show. You can find us on YouTube, all kinds of places. Um, And uh, that's, uh, that's another good time. Yep. Thank you very much for that, uh, Jerry. Jerry, we got some, uh, well, I, I, I will call this a listener question, and we also Ooh. got a listener comment. Excellent. <laughs> first, one, yeah, first one came from our good putty, uh, buddy Hicks at reading oh, yeah. at uh, Hicks at reading underscore Hicks, uh, does the Waiting for Doom podcast and right. does the DC Events co- podcast, which you can find at on Twitter, uh, WFD. Uh, pod and then uh, Doomcast DC OCD pod. So mm-hmm. great, great stuff. And when he found out uh, we were on our last episode, he really, really enjoyed that we were going to cover a great episode. So mm-hmm. a great book. So thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Now, Jerry, we also got a que- question Uh-oh. from uh, listener Robin Stevens at <laughs> Robin 031 Robin. And uh, she asked, well, when's Catwoman's birthday? And we, well, mm-hmm. a- as experts as you and I know on Catwoman, <laughs> we both know that Catwoman's birthday is. March 15th, mm-hmm. which makes her a Pisces. Uh, okay. So she kind of wondered, well, wait a minute. Pisces? That really doesn't sound like Catwoman. Mm. Do you agree? Well, Jerry, I got to confess, I am really not that into astrology, but I thought we'd pick apart some of the traits of a Pisces and wonder if they really do suit Catwoman really quick. Okay. Well, you know, uh, I go go out to, to Google. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I got a few of them down on my notes. Now, Pisces needs a dominant partner or, or role model in their life. Hmm. Is, hmm. Mm, well, Bruce is a dominant personality, but I wouldn't say that she lets him dominate her. Yes, I absolutely <laughs> agree. Here's another one. Pisces will go out of their way to help a friend. Definitely. That's there definitely we go. Selena. Yep. Uh, Pisces does not take well to a position of leadership or a high business person. Uh, we remember, you remember the old, uh, what, John B. Uh, Valentine, uh, Catwoman, where she was yes. running the, uh, she was a kind of a mafia boss. Mm, yes. That didn't really sit with her too well, I don't think. Yes. She's kind of a loner, right? Yes. Yeah. So I think that's, yeah, I would, I would, I would say that sounds good. Yeah. Pisces, uh, are very mysterious and elusive. Absolutely. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Pisces. Pisces have an intuition and psychic ability. Hmm. Intuition. Okay. Yeah, I think Catwoman's got some intuition. Okay. Okay. Well, by by like, there we go. And so okay. once again, Jerry and I are by no means experts, and we <laughs> okay. did not want to offend any Pisces <laughs> listener out there. So I hope we didn't. But I thought that was an interesting interesting question. Um, yeah. So if you have any thoughts as to what you think Catwoman's sign is, uh, just let us know. <laughs> you yeah. can let me know at BTO and Bad Books, or perhaps Jerry know at Professor Frenzy, and we will yeah. share your thoughts and opinions on a future episode if so, we get any feedback. So that's the Ides of March. You know, uh, Julius Caesar could have used her help. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes. Okay, great one. So, um, you know, we have a lot of people who have been uh, liking the show, haven't we, Chris? Yes, thank you so much, Jerry. I I do want to give another uh, shout-out to those folks that have been uh, giving us some nice likes and retweets on our past episode. And we heard from the following people. We heard from Stephanie Mounts at Fancy Nerd Design. Hey, you can catch her out on the TBU Comic Cast, where she offers great opinions and insights. Again, we heard from Hicks at at reading underscore Hicks. I want to give them another shout out. Mm-hmm. Uh, he co-hosts along with Evan Guard at the Doom Patrol podcast. You can find their Twitter feed at WFD pod and the DC events podcast at DC OCD cast. Great. We heard from Batman books, the dark Knight and prose. Oh yeah. Yeah. Batman Books underscore DKP. That's a new one. That's with uh, good friend Lane. Yeah. And she's reading these books. And, you can, you know, it, it's a little tricky. Now, if you've been uh, regularly getting this uh, via iTunes and then you can't find it no more, yep. be sure you're, you're following the new feed, folks, because yeah, she, she moved over to the TBU now, and that's where you can find it. So you might have to uh, resubscribe if you if you uh, find you're not getting any new episodes of that show. So I want to give Lane a shout-out. I'm doing a catch-up. I'm doing a catch-up on that show. 
That's yeah, really. You good. me both because I'm thinking, hey, where's the new show? And I, I had to, I found out that oh, she's on a different feed. Yep. No, yep. so that's that's how I got lost. And we hear, oh, good friend of ours, Sean, uh, oh, yeah. Secret Wars and Beyond podcast at Sean Forty Two A Z. Excellent, always stuff there. Uh, great new episodes over the Pupful Pixel Network, and he's over there on Nerdy Dads as well. We heard from Zach. Uh, Sally at Zach underscore Sally. Awesome. We heard from Martin Loves Comics uh. at Geek Fine. We heard from our good friend Bill Beer at Gotham Night 13. Yeah. We heard from Green Lantern HG at Green Lantern HG. Great. And we heard from Austin Kuykendall at Freebird uh. 316. And again, we heard from Robin Stevens at Robin 031 Robin. Yeah. And we also got a great, great uh, uh, retweet from a good friend for the show, uh, Nightstar uh, 357, awesome. who gave us some really nice words this yeah. past week on a recent episode. And we can't thank you enough for that. And that's at Nightstar 357. Thank you very much for listening. And we sincerely appreciate the kind words. If by chance I overlooked you, which there's been a distinct possibility, especially this week, <laughs> as I'm uh, oh, assisting yeah. with a local show, uh, and, and my time has been really limited and my notes have been very, very scattered. So if uh, I forgot you or overlooked you. My sincerest and deepest apologies. Please let me know on Twitter at BTO on Bad Books or Jerry Noah at Professor Frenzy, and we'll be sure to mention you on our next episode. Thanks, Chris. Well, that's all we have for today. Please join us next time when Chris and I will cover Gotham City Sirens. Oh, I can't wait for that one. <laughs> I love that mm, one. Yes. Uh, my name is Jerry. And I'm Chris. And thank you for listening to Bad Books for Beginners. <laughs> Bad books for beginners, bad books for beginners. Bad books for beginners, bad books for beginners. We're a podcast that discusses them and dress like a bad. Bad books for beginners, bad books for beginners. Mr. Wayne's family and his lady cat. Bad books for beginners, bad books for beginners. Chris and Jerry, what's it all about? Let's break the bad books down. When they take a hard pass And when they lay your money down Bad books for beginners Bad books for beginners Bad books for beginners Bad books for beginners